Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to be your host tonight. I am Grant Baker with my power stash. We are going to bring you some amazing stuff tonight. You have no idea. I'm so excited. It, this is it's going to be a great interview. You guys are going to love it. So you're going to come share a laugh with us and join in on a couple of hours of very informative information. Oh, it's going to be about paranormal UFO, UFOs aliens outright strange and bizarre all the way to aviation and just this is gonna be this is gonna be great don't forget to catch dave scott he's the one that's usually manning our helm monday through friday tonight he is off and he is having a blast with his son congratulations to dave finally getting away for a little you know son father bonding time it's gonna be great it's gonna be awesome also catch jessica jones on the weekends with her new show off the trails she's right on before us when we're doing the after hour show saturday and sunday at 8 p.m uh, pacific time but if you've missed any of our shows you know you can always play them back on youtube our archives are always free our website spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out the bumblefoot reading up on the sor newswire and so much more we ask that you like subscribe and don't forget to ring that bell if you haven't done so already if you could do us a huge favor and share with friends we would absolutely be incredibly grateful for you as it helps spaced out radio grow to bring you our listeners even more content without you SOR, sor would not be possible and for that we thank you for your support and speaking of support please know the super chat is always open in a fantastic way to support everything that we do here at spaced out radio i enjoy bothering dave by the incessant super chats that i give him <laughs> i'm just trying to make him smile on air is all i'm doing we always have a store filled with sor swag and merchandise for your browsing pleasures which supports sor as a whole you can pick up a woo hoodie t-shirt tank top to support sor at all times we also have mugs thermoses and so much more at spacedoutradio.com don't forget to follow us on all our other media sites like tiktok instagram twitter and even facebook links to all these are and more listed down the show notes now grab your favorite beverage and turn the speakers up it's time to get this party started and I'm going to start bringing people in. But before I do that, well, actually, you know, we're going to bring in Dirty Filth first. Hey, Dirty Filth, say hi to everybody that's on the chats. There you go. You got to wave, everybody. <laughs> that's awesome. So tonight's guest, as you can guess, if you read the show notes before you actually clicked on it, is Earl Gray Anderson. He was born in 1958 in Southern California, originally living in Venice, California. He then moved to the city of Thousand Oaks when he was five. Growing up, Earl was always interested in space astronomy, as well as being sort of obsessed with the idea of extraterrestrial life. But being primarily right-brained, he found his passion in becoming a musician and songwriter. Earl has always been interested in UFO phenomenon as his mother worked in aerospace. She worked as a personal secretary for the one and only Howard Hughes. Guess she only seen him once, but that is amazing. And she had to have a high security clearance, which was required for her position. Earl Gray then began his down the rabbit 
his path down the rabbit hole by reading every book on the phenomenon that he could find, after which he decided to become a hands-on field investigator for MUFON. He is now chief investigator in California, assistant state director, as well as a member of MUFON's experience research team. If anybody wants to know, MUFON is the world's oldest and largest organization dedicated to studying alleged UFO sightings for the benefit of humanity. Since becoming a volunteer field investigator in 2015, Anderson has consistently contributed to his efforts. He's personally closed more than 400 cases, 50 of which re received MUFON's most coveted classification, classification unknown. So without further ado, I want everybody to meet Earl Gray Anderson. How are you doing, my man? Doing quite well. How are you doing, Grant? Hey, I have to, I, I, you must have gotten my old bio there. I have to have to get, recap and uh, ch change a, a couple things there. That was a few, a few years old. I'm actually now, I'm a state director of Southern California for MUFON. Uh, I'm an executive committee member of MUFON's ERT, the Experiencer Resource Team, and I have closed over 800 UFO oh, cases. Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> I think that was a, a about a four-year-old uh, bio that you had there. But well, uh, I, everything else is, is, is the same. <laughs> I, I, I haven't gone back in time and changed my birthplace or anything like that, you know. Oh. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. So I got part of it right. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I ended up just okay. copy and pasting a few of those and turning it from first person to third person is what I did. Uh -huh. So, but I was impressed. Grant, <laughs> you were telling me, uh, you know, I was uh, just folks out there in Radio Land and YouTube Land. I was uh, telling Grant I would send him, you know, like a recent, you know, write up and some stuff. And but he actually has listened to a few podcasts that I've been on. He already knew my, my backstory. And that, that was a first that was, thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. Eddie. My pleasure. It, it literally whittled down the hours for me today. As I was working, I got to listen to some extraordinary conversations between you and quite a few other people. I enjoyed every single one of them as well. It, it did not get tiring to hear it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but I did find out something. You you have a few different ways that you like to explain it, or at least, you know, when you're on a show like this and it's a broadcast, usually we sit there and try to direct it. And I do have a plan where I think I want to start out with your earliest memories, because that's the one that struck me the most. When it came to your mother, that story, I, it, I just... There's so much there and so much intrigue. And it just, in a nutshell, it explains just, I mean, it really, truly, it doesn't surprise me that you're in the position you are. Do you, would you mind recapping that story for us tonight? Sure, sure. Um, well, uh, as as you were saying, I, I grew up in, in Venice, California, originally. That was the first five years. And some of that, you know, I, I, I actually strangely have a, a very good memory i don't know where that came from but you know i remember stuff from when i was three years old and, and maybe even younger than that you know uh, i mean i have one memory of batting at this mobile of birds that was overhead and i told my parents about that you know at some point when i was a kid and they said well earl that was hanging over your crib. <laughs> so I don't, you know, I don't know why I, I, I have the memory I have. But it served me quite well when I was in, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm a recently retired uh, nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it worked very good with things like the state board exam. I, I guess I had the second highest score in the state of California. The year that I took my state boards, there's one girl, a, a Korean gal, that, that she beat the heck out of me in the mathematics. You got that correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I do tend to be more right, right brained sometimes. So uh, yeah, but but uh, a lot of that would just be, you know, I would read something and and it's sort of like a photograph, and I could go back to it. It's not perfect. I I know people that truly can sit there and read a page and and just read it back to you by heart you know mm -hmm. I, I can't do that but uh anyhow my my one of my earliest memories of my mom 
was um, when I was five years old, we were in the kitchen in Venice, California, yellow painted walls. And I, I can see the window here that looked out on the backyard, another one that looked out at the fence. <laughs> And, uh, but my mom, I guess she was in a loquacious mood. She was talkative. And for some reason, she wanted to tell me uh, something that she wasn't supposed to tell me. <laughs> and she said, well, you know, Earl, that when I worked for, you know, Mr. Hughes, um, he sent me out to this place uh, that I wound up working at. Um, and he, they didn't tell me anything about where I was going. And, and but it was in the middle of nowhere. She said that they flew me out to, to the middle of the great American desert. That was, she never said where, which yep. desert. There's a couple of them here. Um, at least she said it was in America and it wasn't Saudi Arabia or something. I mean, she went there later on in her career. But um, she, uh, she said they took me out. It was the middle of nowhere and there was this little shack, uh, like a concrete shack. Looked like nothing, just like a storage shack or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they unlocked this thing and they they took her in there and there was an elevator. And uh, she said that she got in the elevator with the security detail that she had. She didn't call it a security detail, but that's that's what it was. And uh, of course, the elevator wasn't going up; it only went down. There was no upstairs to this little shack thing. A uh, concrete bunker, more or less. And uh, she said that she thought maybe you would go down a couple of floors, but it just kept on descending <laughs> into the depths. And she started feeling afraid. She 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 felt vertigo. She the way she put it was, she said, "Well, I felt butterflies in my stomach, and I, you know, it's, it just kept on going down." She said, uh, "When the doors opened up, she, it was a mile underneath the desert floor." She said there was a little city down there. It was active that people got around in golf cart, like little carts. That they had uh, cafes, uh, that they had a bowling alley, a movie theater. Um, and she said that they had a, uh, a barber shop where she could actually go. And she said, well, they, the guy knew how to do my hair. He could, you know, perm my hair and do that for me. So, you know, she never told me how long she would stay down there, but apparently... At times, it was long enough to where she had to have her hair permed. <laughs> um, and she uh, and mom said that they were working on on secret, top secret uh, projects down there. Um, and that was kind of the end of the story. Being five years old, I didn't really question it. It was my mom. Uh, her working for Hughes Aircraft and, and for Hughes himself was no big news. Everybody in my family knew that or best friend that we used to call Aunt Ellen. Uh, Ellen Severson was her name. Uh, she worked for Rand Corporation, which was the, uh, you know, they were a satellite of Hughes Aircraft. They they split off in 1963, I think it was, and became their own independent company. But originally they were part of Hughes. And uh, anyone that, that knows the history of Howard Hughes, he, he didn't make his fortune with aviation uh, he made his fortune creating a better drill bit. Mm -hmm. And if you just kind of think about that a little bit, okay, so drilling for oil, well, if you turn that drill sideways, you can drill a tunnel, you know? Yep. And I always kind of figured, well, maybe there's some kind of connection there. Uh, doing a lot of research, I found out the Rand Corporation, along with the Army Corps of a Engineers, is who built our uh, deep underground bases, probably still is. Um, you know, we have a big... Sepulveda, ban, uh, Sepulveda Dam out here in uh, San Fernando Valley. That's that's where I live in, Sa in Southern California. I'm a valley boy. Mm -hmm. you know, like the Tom Petty song, Free Fall on All Those Streets, he mentions and all that. That's, that's where I live. So, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it wasn't a stretch to figure that there must have been some, you know, some connection between that and the tunneling and the, the digging that, that they did. Uh, to hide their top secret projects. And that's still how we, how we hide them. You know, we have a few facilities out here that are supposedly secret, but are not very secret. People talk about Tijon Ranch and places like that. It's like apparently 20 different levels to that one that Northrop owns. 
Uh, and that was one of my, you know, my mom went on later on uh, to be a corporate headhunter for aerospace companies. That was back in the mid 1970s. Uh, she kind of got tired of playing housewife. I think she had had a very exciting life before. And uh, so my mom was uh, single handedly peopling uh, places like the Rockwell Science Center in Thousand Oaks. She was, uh, you know, Rocket Dyne, Aerojet, Northrop. Uh, at Lockheed Skunk Works, that was one of her contracts. And uh, she would talk about Ben Rich and they, they would talk on the phone. I mean, when she was, you know, in the, uh, you know, towards the end of her life back in the, or, you know, 1990s, my mom would be on the phone in her house and be yucking it up and laughing and joking with, with, uh, you know, Ben Rich. Um, so anyway, uh, so the story of the deep underground base was really interesting and, and mom didn't really, you know, she, she, I would bring it up every once in a while and she looked a little surprised that I remembered it. Um, but the other thing my mom would talk about was a, a life in the universe. And she spoke about it with authority as though she knew that it wasn't just something she'd heard on TV or read about. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, you know, she let me know that uh, we weren't alone, that that uh, there was life out there. You know, speaking of life out in the cosmos, of course, most of us believe in that because just mathematically speaking, it's almost impossible not to have other types of life out there. But, um, you know, one of my favorite all time movies, I think I'm a real big movie buff. I, I love movies. And one of my favorite ones is Star Wars. And I don't want to get down the rabbit hole on why see three PO's leg turned silver, but <laughs> that is a good now, question. I heard that you took your mom to a Star Wars movie. That was later on when I was about 19 years old. Oh. Um now I in my research uh, in in uh you know, dumbs is what they call them, deep underground military bases. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that a lot of those people that worked in those early underground bases uh, came away with with cancers. Oh. Uh, and my mom kept on getting cancer after cancer. She had an oncologist that she had gone to, you know, she'd gone through about six bouts of this, you know, and, and all unrelated. It wasn't ever, me, you know, metastatic. It was always... Uh, you know, she, she said that they told her it, it appeared that it, she had been irradiated or something the way that this was happening. So, uh, but anyway, she was going to see her oncologist and it was 1977 and she got a clear bill of health. I went with her support and uh, she was really happy. This was now her doctor was in Santa Monica. It was just blocks away from her old office. So I think that the stars kind of aligned for me that day. You know, she had a clean bill of health. You know, the, the reason why it could have been otherwise was because of the work that she did. And there's the old Hughes building on Sepulveda. So we, we saw Star Wars and when the curtains were closing, my mom started talking. And, uh, at that time, I was kind of, I was taking pre-seminary classes. I was planning on being a minister. I, I oh would have been a good one, actually. You know, I cared about people and, you know, it takes empathy to do that correctly. And uh, But it was, my mom started talking about how Star Wars was not far-fetched. She said, uh, son, you have no idea how close to the truth this is. She said that, uh, you know, the different forms of life, the, this different, you know, spacecraft, um, just the strangeness in general that she said that it's, it's so close to the truth. She said, it's realer than you will ever know. Wow. Uh, she said that they'll never tell the public this. So they won't tell the public because they're afraid of the public's reaction that, you know, people would make a rush to the banks, people, you know, she, she brought up the HG Wells radio, you know, presentation that Orson Wells did mm -hmm. where people were jumping off of buildings and stuff uh, they thought that we were under attack yep. um but what she told me stuck with me through the years now when she was telling me this it was really an inconvenient truth at that point you know it was like god created us and we're on earth the crown of creation and all this and 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 here's my mom telling me that there's other races and that you know it was just kind of wild stuff 
And uh, I think that for myself, it was an inconvenient truth at the time. I didn't want to hear it. Uh, in a way, if I could have gone la 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 and stuck my fingers in my ears, I, I probably would have. But I got about 10, 15 minutes of good full on disclosure, or at least it seems like that's how long it was. Uh, if I ever get hypnotically regressed, that is what I would want to go back to. I would want to remember the entire conversation because I know there's parts that I just didn't want to hear. And I, I don't remember what she said because I didn't want to hear it in the first place. Um, as time went on, you know, my religious ideas uh, evolved and, and things, uh, it, it became a point of interest to get my mom to talk more. Uh, but then in the meantime, she she started working in aerospace again. I guess her NDEs and all that stuff that you have to sign came back into play in a stronger way. And uh, she was just zip. You know, she wouldn't talk about it. I mean, I even took her to see the movie uh, E.T., right? <laughs> Thinking I might get another little disclosure number. And, and all my mom had to say was, was, it's a cute movie. But I don't think they're all that nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it makes me wonder. I, did she ever watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind? You know, I'm sure she. I know she did, but she didn't ever say anything about it. And maybe it was too close for. Oh, you know, I've heard that before. Yeah. There's, there's actually a few people that talk about Spielberg and how he went in and got certain information from certain people. But I mean, who's well, Heideck was, you know, a, a, a consultant as well as yep. uh, Jacques Vallée. He, he was certainly in touch with the right people at that time. So, and, and there are, you know, cases in there, you know, the police officers chasing the UFO is a case in, I think, Montana. It was, uh, you know, they, he did, you know, go from blue book case files to get a lot of that stuff. Yep. But she she just acted like nothing. She didn't say anything about that film. Yeah, <laughs> she 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 really held tight to those NDAs. I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. Now you know as time went on, I mean, every once in a while I'd get like a little glimmer. Once in a while she'd let her guard down, or she there there was one point maybe I was maybe twenty one or so, and I just I really was just frustrated. I wanted to know more, even what she was doing down there. I said. You know, mom, what are you, what were you guys doing down there? Were you working with aliens? Were you working with, you know, the, the CIA? What the heck, you know, tell, give me something, you know, she just looked frustrated and kind of mad and she was walking away and she was halfway down the hall and then she stopped and she turned back around and came back in. And, uh, yeah, I remember her shoes going clop, clop, clop when she, you know, went from the carpet to the tile floor. And she stood there and she looked at me uh, kind of expressionless. And she said, I'll tell you one more thing. You were down there. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, you were down there. You were down there. Um, she said, uh, you know, I was pregnant with you while I was still working there. And, and, uh, I went, I know that I went down there at least once while I was pregnant with you. So technically you were in the little city underneath the desert. Uh, she did like a little half smile, turned around and walked away. And, and that was kind of it. But, uh, and, and towards the end of my mom's life, uh, she passed away in 1999, uh, April Nine, uh, it's like April 21st, 1999, I think. Um, towards the end of her life, I she seemed to to, to get a little f freed up as far as talking about it. Like I had a, one friend who was a total skeptic of any of this stuff. He, he you know, subscribed to Skeptic, uh, the Skeptic Magazine or <laughs> one of those, you know, and, and didn't believe in any of this stuff. And, and so I finally told him, you know what, let's just, see if mom will tell you. And uh, this is my friend, Ken. And I, I took him out to, to my mom had her, you know, at that point, a hospital bed set up in the family room and, and was kind of stationed in there. And, and I, you know, I just said, you know, Ken, he doesn't believe me what I'm telling him about what you used to do. Which just for one, just for me once, just tell him that I'm not, you know, full of baloney. And uh, she told him, she, she said, uh, well, what, what's hard to believe about that? I mean, where would you hide things? 
from from the population if you had secrets and she said yes i worked in a deep underground uh, facility and in the middle of nowhere and people weren't aware of it and they're still not as you know they're still not aware of it and uh, earl isn't lying to you <laughs> and ken re really loved my mom and so it, it was just like his face just kind of he, he, his expression just dropped wasn't what he thought he was going to hear. Okay. Um, and I actually, you know, I, I even talked to my mom about perhaps law lawyering up and going after the people, whoever it was, if it was the Pentagon or who, that uh, hadn't protected her um, when they sent her down there. You know, I, I you know, mom, uh, it's not like we were a, a, a rich family. We weren't poor, but we, we were certainly not well to do. And uh, my mom's response to that was, was, son, I'm very proud of what I did. And if I could do it over again, I would do it over again exactly the way that I did. I was serving my country. I was, you know, doing my patriotic duty or what I thought was my patriotic duty. And I would never sue my government. You know, I, I love my country. And that was, uh, that was it. I mean, I think I asked her about Bob Lazar once and she played dumb or maybe he isn't real. I don't know, but she just said, Bob Lazar, who's that? You know, I said, oh, it was some guy that was working out in some facility that was underground in the middle of the desert that says that he saw flying, you know, saucers. And <laughs> she just wouldn't say anything about it. She kind of laughed it off. Oh, my goodness. And that's, that's my so mom. Funny. <laughs> oh man but it you know, planted the seed you know i mean that 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 you know i i started really reading books about it at the time i i i the one that really hit me hard was the leslie keen's book you know about pilots and and uh all that and uh I, I felt like I got to the point where I had read so much and I'd seen so many documentaries and I still didn't know if it was real or not. You know, it's like, well, mom said this, but it's so it's just crazy. You know, this is so crazy. And it went, you know, Carl Sagan said it wasn't real and Isaac Asimov said it wasn't real and Arthur C. Clarke said it was hogwash. And, you know, how, why am I, you know, how can I believe this? And that's what I decided to join uh, MUFON and become a field investigator and, and find out for myself. I, I kind of started investigating UFOs as with a skeptical attitude. I, I didn't even know if it if my mom was just, you know, spouting BS or if it was real. And um, I mean, everything around my mom and the people she knew and stuff like that certainly led me to believe that, you know, it was true. And my mom was not a liar, or a teller of tall tales. Um, but that was kind of what led me into that. And uh, it changed my life. When you poke at this phenomenon, we were talking about this earlier, Grant, you, you can't be surprised when it pokes back. Exactly. It's an interactive phenomenon. Um, and if you start investigating it, you better believe it's going to start investigating you. It probably already knows about you anyway, if you have the propensity for this stuff. I, I believe that you're absolutely right. And real quick, I'd like to thank your mom for her service. I mean, oh, she, one day, hopefully when, if anything ever does come out from the military and the government or whatever it was that she did, I hope she gets accolades for that. And, uh, you know, she, she sounded like a real you know, patriot to our country. And yes, so my hat's off to her. And thank and you. Absolutely. I got a question for you. So you, you sure. went into MUFON and, and I, we got about another couple of minutes, but just real quick, do, does anybody else that works in MUFON, whether it be field investigators or the higher ups, how many of you actually come into that position or to that role with a skeptical mind? Is that mm -hmm. something that's common or is is it you might be the only one of you no i think i've got uh, a few people i mean i've i've got uh, astrophysicists that are working for me as field investigators right now and one in particular i think that she knows a phenomenon is real but i think that she's she doesn't know which parts of it are okay. um and and uh, you know she 
I can't talk too much because I don't want to get her in trouble, but she does have a government job, yeah, not yeah. CIA or anything like that. But, you know, she's a, a, a astrophysicist that works for, you know, works in, in uh, aerospace and um, wonderful field investigator. I have another guy who's a, a, a retired police detective. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I mean, they make wonderful field investigators because you don't want somebody in there that's going to, be a true believer type where every single little thing that comes in, you know, the first thing you run to is, Oh, that's a UFO. Yeah. Um, I found that Heineck, you know, JL and Heineck uh, was correct. Um, when he said that five to 10% of our reports are interesting and the rest are prosaic objects that were misidentified or stars, planets, satellites, rocket launches, um, right. yeah. And that, that really does kind of hold true people, you know, especially now that this is on the front page of the news ever since the whole Tic Tac reveal, um, people are, are more open to believing in UFOs. Um, and then we have the opposite problem. We got people that'll see a drone or see, you know, a, a mylar balloon, you know, in a wind current where it's flashing, looks like Morse code or something. And instantly, you know, some people run to that and, and think it's a UFO. And mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't, that's not helpful. You know, we've got certain markers we look for and, you know, a light in the sky. Okay. Now for you and for myself, if I see a light in the sky, that's strange. It's not a, it, uh, it's not a known planet that's supposed to be out. It's not the ISS space station or anything. Um, you know, that's maybe a friendly hello, but as far as, you know, investigations go, it's not real helpful because yeah. a light in the sky, unless it does something anomalous, if it shoots up out of the atmosphere. Okay. That's interesting. All right. I, I want that case report, yep. but if it's just a light in the sky, that's moving around, it's, you know, most likely a drone or, you know, something that, that we have built, um, you know, yeah. just the way it is. And then I know it gets people, you know, up in arms and very angry when I have to tell them that what they saw was a drone. But I mean, I have the flash patterns on, on these guys yep. down, you know, and you, I can just time it and recognize just by how many times it flashes, you know, oh, yeah. unless the ETs are trying to look like a little drone on flash mode, it's probably a drone. You know? That's uh, very true. So, <laughs> Real quick, I'm going to go ahead and say hi. I'm just going to take this moment to everybody in the chats. Paul Holland, welcome in. And you've got Gold Place, it looks like. Kevin Whip, welcome into the chats. Nightmare, always good to see you. Oh, my goodness. This is going to be awesome. So we have D. Cohen. Welcome back. And then I got Magneticus Attractus. Got to love that name. Always Magnetic love that. Joe Monk. Magneticus Attractus? Wow. Yes. Yeah, and really when I was in the screen. chats, I was always just Grantavius. But if you see me in any other type of format, it's always like Grantavius Max. And I do it just <laughs> to be different. And then we have Joe Monk. Always good seeing you, my friend. Ann Palmer, welcome back to the chats. Gotta love her. All right, who else do we got here? There's a ton of people. Oh, my goodness. Welcome UFO people. And welcome all <laughs> UFO people. All people. All welcome. North Alabama cryptid. Oh, oh man, we got some great people in our chats. I will tell you that. Fantastic, right now. Travis W. Always good seeing you. Applesauce, welcome back. Let's see here, Stars Guard. Good seeing you, my friends. Susan Place, welcome. Henry X, welcome to SOR chats. And let's see, Black Dragon. Always good seeing you here as well. I gotta say, when I see certain people. Vets are always welcome here. This is a safe place, a safe haven for all vets. We appreciate and love yes. your support for our country. And to you, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without your service. And we all thank you so much. Thank you thank for you your so service. Much. Yep. Filthy is who's also on the screen. Uh, <laughs> good seeing you, my friend. He's painting something really cool. I'm watching him 
as he's going along here, he's got the shadowing and all this down. I haven't figured out what it is yet, but it, it takes will. a while. So he does stuff like this. You can see the little art right there. Mm -hmm. He always does the background first. And then once he starts doing the outline, that's when it all comes together. And it's pretty cool to watch. That's great. <laughs> yeah, if Spencer. you draw the main figure first, then you got to, yep. yeah, that, that you give it away. Start bleeding into each other and stuff too. It's good and, to draw the background first. I'm going to, Take a quick second as well, just because Dirty Filth is on screen. This is Dirty Filth book, Cryptid Cartoons. You can get it on Amazon as we speak. It helps everybody out. And this is what you, we would call a plethora Ooh. of his drawings. I love it. I just got it in the mail. Thank you so much. If anybody wants to have him scribble in it, uh, we are going to have a little bit of a lineup in Vegas. We will all be there. Bring your books with you, and he will literally graffiti the inside just for you whether it's a dot a hammer or maybe even a sneeze <laughs> one way shape or <laughs> form <laughs> oh my goodness no we we love we love dirty filth here and he is my brooder shop i love that man i can't wait to have him at the house get him on the lake so we can go fishing together <laughs> sounds good absolutely all right, so back to the story at hand. So you you before you went into move on though, you were you were a nurse or RN, correct? Uh, I actually was a hands-on LVN. I you oh. know, everybody wanted me to get my RN, but I was working, you know, and I was a single father for a good portion of that time. And so I was kind of, you know, keeping the roof up and the lights on and you know, and I I do want to be able to go out for my sushi or a nice steak or something once in a while. <laughs> so I, you know, I worked really, uh, I worked a lot, uh, taking care of quadriplegics. That's what I did. Uh, I, I, I worked in the hospital and, and, and clinics a couple of times, but I, I loved taking care of, uh, people as a home nurse. And, uh, and you, you know, you'd get to know people. I, I had, uh, one gentleman, I worked for him, for uh 17 years or oh, i think my. it was longer than that um and and until he you know passed away i mean he unfortunately had uh, muscular dystrophy and the heart's muscle but uh i uh working as a nurse i think was a good thing because you know i learned the legalities of that you know you have to have a strong backing in your sciences and your mm -hmm. biological sciences and all that and hipaa law that we had to adhere to is very similar to the way that i treat my experience or cases because um for some of these people if the information came out that they were being you know abducted by aliens uh it could ruin their lives uh you know i've got you know homeland security agent that does uh, you know head of uh tsa at a major airport and you know you have to protect people um so that because there is still unfortunately prejudice out there um you start talking about you know having a face-to-face -face encounters people can be very judgmental especially if you're in a position of authority or working a government job or something like that and experiencer cases run the gamut as, as i'm sure you know you know i've oh, got yeah. uh you know doctors lawyers uh even some movie stars who, whose names you would recognize if i mentioned them you know and um, and, and you'll have, uh, people from all walks, you know, garbage collectors and ballet dancers and rock and rollers, you know, it's, uh, I, the, it seems like they're interested in certain bloodlines, but, um, you know, people find their, their heart's desire sometimes, or they find themselves working in a certain position and there they are. And, you know, so the, kind of runs the gamut as far as uh backgrounds and stuff and th that was always helpful and still is right. um the charting that we would do is the same kind of charting that i'll do for my cases uh, descriptive language um th this has been an issue recently with mufon and they they actually talked about this a bit at the state directors meeting that uh you know if you go in there and you say you know uh the person saw an orb Mm -hmm. right 
well, you know that there, there are orbs that are more like in paranormal stuff. Uh, you've got Glenda, the good witch of the north, I guess, where, where she would travel around as an orb and then appear, and Obi-Wan Kenobi, and uh, that that's one thing. But but then I've got people that see like something like a Foo Fighter. I mean, my mom had in it. We can talk about that at some point. We got two hours, right? Oh, yeah. She saw something that was like this, this, she called it ball lightning, but it wasn't ball lightning. Um, How old it, was your mom when this happened? She was 16 years 16. old. That's right. She was living in Muscatine, Iowa. I can tell you about that, but I, I don't want to talk about one thing and go off on a tangent, but we can if you want. Well, I mean, it really does have to do with orbs. I mean, yeah. there, are, there are all kinds of orbs out there. And I have and like I, a guy, 30 foot circumference thing with a surface and they're calling it an orb. And it's like, dude, that's a spherical craft, you know, another woman, you know, with, you know, she was taken and and put in an orb. It was almost like an out of body experience. And she called it an orb. But again, it was this circular craft that she mm -hmm. could she she could, you know, make it travel by thought. And they were showing her something. I mean, that's. We, we find that there are a lot of teachable moments in um, the abductions and visitations that we have now. At one time, it was all, you know, DNA farming, and that seems to have kind of slowed way down. Not completely, but you don't hear that so much. You hear about people, you know, being put in extraordinary... I, I've had a few people tell me that same story, where they're suddenly in a craft and they're in the driver's seat. And they're being shown something about telepathy, I think. They're being shown something about space-time and, and time itself. And and what better way to teach someone than to put the, you know, throw them in the pool and you know swim, you know. Yeah. Hands so, on. but orbs are not all the same damn thing, you know. They're some are like the spiritual things that you'll see in more paranormal studies, and then you've got like you know, we we had one uh, circular spherical craft that a, a a commercial pilot, his wife and his brother-in-law reported uh, from Catalina Island. And this thing came out of the ocean. It was gold colored. It was shown by its own light, just really bright. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy was good at dead reckoning because he's a pilot. Uh, so he said it was about 10 miles off the coast, and that would have been 10 miles off of the, the mainland. So kind of right, you know, equ equidistant from the mainland in Catalina Island. And he watched this thing rise way up in the air and do sort of a crosswise pattern. It went back into the drink and then shot out again. By this time, his wife and his brother-in-law are out there watching this thing. And uh, that was not what I would call an orb. You know, it had to have been 300 feet across. Uh, I had a, a, a boat captain and his crew uh, report the same thing that they had. It, they thought that there were, they thought it was a full moon at first. Right. And it wasn't the full moon, you know, the full moon was over here. And uh, this, this spherical object was over their ship. They, they were just kind of huddling and afraid. Um, so the, the, the word orb is kind of a, just not a distinct and accurate word. And so my whole, I, my feeling about this is, is, you know, if you describe it using descriptive language, like you would, you know, nurses aren't allowed to diagnose, right? right. So you have somebody come into the ER that's got, you know, chicken the credentials. Pot. <laughs> All right. They come in with, you know that it's chicken pox, but you can't write that down. You're not a physician. So you say patient is exhibiting, you know, red welts all over his body, petechiae, um, you know, some scabbed over, ew, gross, uh, high fever. And any doctor that will read that will know, uh, yeah, chicken pox. And, and that's the way that I w do my UFO work. Say witness a uh, flying saucer. Um, is this not descriptive language? It leads too much to the imagination. Yep. So I'm kind of a stickler about that. So see, I, I, I went back to our original topic there. That, that's where my background in nursing really, really helps. That's awesome. <laughs> you literally, when you just did something, and I actually had a, 
I don't know if you ever seen something or I don't know. It, I just had a shock, a shocking sensation side because you said something that that I have seen previously. In fact, if one of these days I'll have to converse with you about it. But when you went like this and it was doing that, get, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that gave me chills. Mm -hmm. I've seen those. Uh -huh. And the the orbs is one of the ones, and like I was talking to you about you before, one had chased me. And if anybody wants to see that, just go back in our archives and you can mm -hmm. see my whole thing on that. But these are real. And oh, I know. Oh, man. It's it, like when it comes to everybody wants to say, oh, disclosure this, disclosure that. It's already happened. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's one of those things that we're the ones that have to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Now, you, were, you know, we're on the orb subject at the moment. And I would actually, I'd really love to talk about your mom's experience when she was 16, because let's do that, that is such an amazing, amazing experience. And I know what it is. So everybody in the chat, hold on to your seats because this is awesome. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I wonder if, if, you know, before my mom, if anybody in, in our family had, had an encounter, but the mm -hmm. first one that I know of is, is what my mom used to call her uh, ball lightning experience. And when she was 16 years old, she and her, her younger sister, uh, Mary, they would go and sleep on the porch. Uh, like many Midwestern homes, they, uh, they had it screened in. So you could sleep out there. It was cool, you know, no air conditioning there. You know, this was back in the 1930s. So uh, they would sleep out there in little sleeping rolls. And uh, so I, I guess that my aunt was already asleep. Uh, my mom was kind of getting ready to go to sleep. <clears throat> she lay down at her pillows behind herself. And uh, there was this buzzing sound. She turned around and she said that it was about the size of a beach ball, that it was a ball of sparks. Like if you took a bunch of sparkler fireworks and a perfect ball. She said that it pushed its way through the screen, like it, it sounded like a hive of angry bees. Uh, it first came over to her sister. It was under intelligent control. This thing went to where her sister was. It hovered there for a little bit, like it was observing. And then it came over to where my mom was. And she said that it was just like eye level to her, this, this ball of sparks. And she thought, you know, she always described it as ball lightning. Um, but ball lightning only lasts three to five seconds. That's mm. it. You know, I've talked with people who know, uh, Dr. Irina Scott, uh, we, we talked about this at length because she and her sister had a experience with a ping pong ball sized, uh, thing like that when they were little girls. Uh, so anyway, my mom said that this thing pushed its way back through the screen porch and uh, it started cruising over towards where the neighbors had a cornfield planted. So my mom got up out of her sleeping roll and she started running out towards this field. And she said that it looked like it was waiting for her. It was about 30 feet in the air. And she got right under it, she said. And she's looking up and it rose up a little bit higher and then it popped and it was gone. She said it smelled like, uh, well, it smelled like ozone is what it smelled like but she said it smelled like uh, uh, an electric train transformer is what she used to say so it's electricity um, oh man and that that was no ball lightning it was under intelligent control i think that it was probably like the foo fighters the same time period you know my dad was a tail gunner in a b-17 in world war ii and they saw they saw those yeah you know. And they That's were amazing. flying over Germany and, and the European theater. That was uh, not an uncommon thing. Uh, they thought that it was a German super weapon or something, but uh, it was no. And <laughs> nobody had that technology. Oh, man. Well, I mean, yeah, we, we hear about the Foo Fighters and things, but then, I, and like you said, this thing's in, under intelligent control. And it was almost like it, it was an observer of some sort because it, it kind of yeah. sounds like they were just looking at each other. When, mm -hmm. when they're sitting there and then it's just like oh hey come on out here i want to show you something and then check this out watch pop bye yeah i think that a lot of these smaller uh spherical objects that people see uh yeah i mean skinwalkers at the pentagon you know uh colm kelleher and, and and those guys wrote that book and the pentagon forced them to edit it twice so i i them and we, we talked about it, but it has uh, a guy in Australia was actually killed by one of those. It 
flew into his car and it or his truck, I guess, and and it took his it decapitated the guy. Oh my! Uh, the 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 daughter, I think it was, is who witnessed this, and uh, you know, it's not like you make something up like that when no. somebody that you love has been killed, you know, by something anomalous. So we know they're out there. Um, I mean, if it was, you know, total BS, I, I'm sure that the, the Pentagon probably would have had them edit that out or, you know, but uh, there it is, you know, very, very strange. And the, the, this is this phenomenon. It is so strange. Um, um, we tend to go and use paranormal terms for things. And I think that's what MUFON is doing is they're trying to rein that in so that we're using scientific language. Uh, to describe technologies that, uh, you know, I mean, here I got my, you know, my my smartphone, and if you gave that to Leonardo da Vinci, he would think that was paranormal, but it's actually very very high technology. Uh, well, you you mentioned Arthur <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke a little bit ago. Now I'm I gonna got a story gonna, about him too. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I have read the Rama series four times, maybe all the way through. I, I absolutely those books. I love those books, especially when it comes to the, if anybody that hasn't read this is listening to this show. Spoiler alert: there are spiders in it. <laughs> yes, there are. Rendezvous the they, with Rama. Yes, <clears throat> and I loved every bit of that book. How they traveled through space and they got to float in the little gel, and and it, they didn't feel any kind of. It was great. And the way the the alien spiders would talk with the colors that would swirl around their head, just I love those books. <laughs> and but he had said something, and just like you held up your phone, and Leonardo da Vinci would think that was pure magic. And what what mm -hmm. was the quote that the other? Any Parker sufficiently said? advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's exactly. Arthur Clark's, uh, I think, his second law. He had the three laws, <laughs> Clark's three laws. But uh, yeah, indistinguishable from magic. <clears throat> so, what's your story on him? Um, my friend, uh, I, I'm friends with with Paul Heineck, uh, J. Allen Heineck's son, is actually a really close friend of mine, and uh, he has a letter from Arthur C. Clarke to his father. Uh, he and Clark were were pen pals, um, and and Clark in this letter said, you know, I can't say it in public. Uh, I wouldn't get invited to be on the news for the moonshots or, you know, some doors would close for me if I told everybody this, but I really think that you're doing a, an amazing job of what you're doing. And I think that some of what you're reporting is, is extraterrestrial. Uh, I don't think it's all swamp gas and, and, and things like that. And it was written in Clark's, I mean, I, I knew it was Clark. It was his handwriting. It was a handwritten letter signed by him and his beautiful, you know, language. Uh, just uh, so apparently Clark knew. Uh, I've heard that that uh, same thing for Carl Sagan, that his, his uh, first uh, published paper was actually, he, he said, if you want to find aliens, you don't need a telescope. You need archaeologists. It was more or less ancient alien uh, theory, <laughs> you know, but uh, you can't even find that paper now. I, I have it like a screenshot of it somewhere. Uh, his his uh, widow has taken it down, apparently, because it's no longer available to read. Uh, but up until a couple of years ago, you could read that paper. Um, you know, Sagan knew that. But uh, Kathleen Marden, I guess that, that she and, and uh, Stanton Friedman had, had looked into that matter and that Stanton had a, had a letter uh, that was from uh, Carl Sagan that was pretty much the same kind of thing. You know, I can't really talk about this or I'd lose funding. But, you know, I think that uh, there's something to this uh, that, that we're not alone. So uh, a lot of these guys are, you know, I mean, our, our, our government's tried to keep it tamped down. I'm sure it's kind of, there's a lot of things in play with that. You know, I mean, first of all, um, if, if they went and disclosed, they would have to explain things like Roswell, where, you know, the whole town was pretty much put under martial law and, you know, people were, were threatened, children were threatened. Uh, to not talk about what actually what they saw and what was going on. 
Yeah. So they, you know, it's a serious matter for them. It's also national security. They have to worry about what the other technologically advanced countries have, um, and spies and all that stuff. And and if they go and they tell the, what well, I mean, what are they going to say? You know, it's yeah, it's real, and it's you know far advanced from us, and we can't protect you from it. Um, they're not going to say that. Instead, they're going to act like it's something new. They're going to call it UAP instead of UFO. Pretend like they're suddenly interested in it, even though we have, you know, from FOIA reports all the way back to the 1940s, they they knew that something was going on and it wasn't us. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's just one of the things that's it. I wish they had the ability to say something, especially back then. I understand now because we have certain censors that we don't want other countries to know about. It's like, okay, when you see something and we have a 4K video of it off of one of our carriers or cruisers that are out there and they're like, oh, how did you get a video of something moving that fast so clearly? And this is something very minor. I'm not saying this is something we have. It's probably something we have, but I'm saying like, the fact that we have the ability to catch these things on something that's just like normal cameras like that shows mm -hmm. on top of that, though, how did you know it was coming? You know, that starts getting into radar and other, other sensors that we have. How did you know it was coming past 80,000 feet? How did you track it out in space? And so we don't want anybody knowing all that kind of stuff, like right. exactly what we have. But back then, when you see the picture of of the gentleman and i just completely forgot his name holding and the look on his face holding that balloon the weather balloon from the roswell oh, that's jesse jesse marcel senior jesse, yes. yep. and i know that family and they they grew up with him you know denise was one of my field investigators for a while really? she got too busy you know doing stuff with the history channel and and she had to kind of put it aside but uh denise marcel is a fantastic ufologist and uh there's a lot of emotion in that family because their father was shut up purposefully and he wasn't happy about it um you know it made him look like an idiot this is the man who is head of security at the only atomic base in in the world at the yeah. time uh, that's that's some serious security cred right there. And uh, they made him say that he didn't know the difference between a crashed, silly foil weather balloon and, and a starship. If you look yeah. at the photograph of him holding the, the, the bag with a, you know, <laughs> the radar, you know, balloon in it, he, he looks just horrified and shocked and, and disgusted. Uh, the, that photograph says it all. And the family knows that. And someday we are hoping that, that the, the, you know, the authorities will come clean and uh, Jesse Marcel senior will be in the history books along with people like Neil Armstrong and, and uh, Albert Einstein and other people that have changed the way that we live and see the universe. It's a great, yeah. man. Yeah. And unfortunately it's something we'll probably never find out, but yeah, I don't know. Here's I, open. Here's open. open. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I was so surprised. I mean, when they didn't deny the Tic Tac uh, video, and and uh, you know, they they uh, you know the recent congressional hearings they had were kind of frustrating at times because mm -hmm. you know that they were you know as soon as they started saying something interesting, this guy's going, well, let's go to the side room. You know, it is not ready for prime time. I guess. Uh, but just the fact that they're not calling it swamp gas uh, and that they're actually uh, treating it, you know, they're not punishing uh, soldiers and pilots for reporting these shows that there's a, a change that's happened there. That's a so good there thing. is hope. There is definitely hope. You know, when it came, when I first listened to Commander David Fravor and he was on a show that I had just, I was driving and I had two hours to go. I listened to that whole show and I'm mm -hmm. not going to, it was just one I happened to listen to. I'll, I can tell you later on who it was, but the real thing was I listened to it twice mm -hmm. in a row just to catch everything. And this is a man that is a commander of a flight battalion. That's right. You don't get there from being an idiot. You don't get there for making up stories. He got there because he deserves to get there. He worked his way up the ranks, became what he became. He was entrusted with billions of dollars worth of equipment. 
it's like this guy is going to be one of the higher, more believable people. Just like you were saying, you know, in some other shows that I've listened to you in, when you have police officers working for you and doing, you know, investigation stuff, they're very cut and dry. It's this, 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 and this. Just you facts, know, man. Just yeah. facts. And when you have people like Commander David Faber on on a on a show talking about this, and then comes back in, of course, he has a few jokes about that, and then another, you know, one of the pilots goes out there and catches the actual video. You know, these are things that that right there, just in of itself, that's proof. And you're yes. getting that from the military. You're getting that, even though Commander David Fravor is now retired, it's still him. He still did that. There it is. I mean, it, I mean, do you have any? I got to ask. Does Mufon take, or have you ever seen any paper come across your desk from military? Um, I have plenty of people that. Uh, tell their stories after after they're out of the military okay. once in a while i'll get uh, i had a couple of guys who sent me a, a video from their radar screen they were they were in the navy and they were uh, in a helicopter and they had a uh, actually no it was a it was a FLIR video it was a, okay. a yeah it, it was an infrared video and it was these two objects that were just hovering in place perfectly and, uh, and it looked really strange. It looked really an anomalous. But with further study, what I realized it was, and it was confirmed to be, was it was the burners of a jet, the afterburners. <laughs> but it was going away from them. So it looked like it was hovering steadily in the same oh my spot. Goodness. But those guys were active duty. You know, yeah. uh, their their CO was in, in on it. She, she knew that they were, you know, putting in a report to move on so apparently the the you know people in the military are trusting that that they aren't going to be you know judged and 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 uh yeah that, it, that it's a, a new day and this is a good thing yep. and speaking of day i mean kevin day there, there's another friend you know i had lunch with him and, and his uh his uh sig other uh kim uh, a few months ago and we were talking about the. I had the coordinates that that uh, commercial pilot saw that thing come out of the water, and he's looking at the coordinates and he said, "Well, Earl, this is uncanny because these are the exact same coordinates of where we found the tic tac, same really? same spot. Yeah, it's a very active area. The whole Baja coast uh, and East uh, Catalina Island, and and it's gone back for a long, long time. I mean, there's some interesting films that." Uh, uh, I mean, there's a very, very good flying saucer <laughs> film. See, I'm breaking my own rules, but uh, disc-shaped UFO with a cupola on top. Uh, a wonderful uh, uh, a film. It's not a video. It's it's from the 1950s uh, going right across Catalina Island. So something's mm -hmm. going on in the ocean there, I guess, is some kind of perhaps uh, underwater base or they have some, you know, trans uh universal way of coming up through there uh I, i'm not sure i have seen propositions from back in the 1950s for uh, underground bases i mean i you know i made kind of a study of that stuff and i'm obsessed with it because of my mom um but they uh one idea was was to build a, a base underground under the ocean so you have to go under the ocean and then you dig a mile down so it's not only under the ocean hidden it's a mile underground as well <laughs> oh my gosh i know how about that i'm sure that with stuff like that and and if our visitors didn't have something like that i'd be quite surprised yeah that's true because i mean we do have the technology to scan the ocean floor mm-hmm Purposely, yeah, they, they, boomers, you know, the submarines, they're constantly seeing fast walkers. Mark yeah. D'Antonio, you know, he's MUFON's video analyst. He was on a, a submarine and, and they had a, a, a fast walker while he was there on the radar deck. And no, they, they were all good and excited, wild. you know, fast walker, fast walker, you know. And, and they're moving. <laughs> they're moving. It's yeah. moving just like it would through the air. No resistance. I mean, the Tic Tac went Mach 18, uh, 18 times the speed of sound. It did not make a single sonic boom. 
Yep. Uh, 190 degree turns and, and without turning whoever was flying that thing into mush, you know, is, you know, kind of flipping off Isaac Newton. And <laughs> yeah, it just uh, they, they have a different physics that they adhere to than uh, the ones that uh, it's, it's more more like a old Warner Brothers uh, Roadrunner cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet Al Kubier is like, yes. <laughs> uh, hello. Hello. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh yeah, we're using your technology. It's a little more advanced, but you got on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, gosh, man, 800, 800 cases. And I, is that that's cases closed, right? Mm-hmm. So how many out cases of that have bunch you? I have maybe 65 cases, 66 cases that uh, I deemed uh, enough evidence was there to give them the, the coveted uh, unknown status. So on the, on that, now that's just you. So mm -hmm. with MUFON all the way across the United States or even globally, that's a really high number just for you. You know, 66 cases out of 800, that's, that's a pretty significant percentage. So now I know that you, you're pretty... You got the great unknown classifications for those, but I mean, realistically, how many cases are going through move on, you know, year? We're, there's, well, I can, I mean, we, let's see what case number we're up to now. I don't <laughs> want to come in tonight. Um, let me see. I can, I can give from about this afternoon. Uh, hold on one second. Okay, here we go. Well, this is case number. One hundred and twenty three thousand seven hundred and seventy eight. Holy moly. <laughs> so <laughs> and I think that they started the numbering system when we went to the computer management system. So, you know, as they were doing it before that. Yep. And MUFON's been here for 54 years. You know, we've been, uh, Project Blue Book shut their doors, and that's the same year, 1969, is when MUFON opened their doors and mm -hmm. uh, been doing the Air Force's job ever since, as they say. <laughs> yeah, there's a question for you. Has anybody in the Air Force ever sent in a, uh, a hey, this is what I've seen? I, other than I had that one case where that guy, you know, a lot of people, they'll get out of the armed forces and then they'll tell their stories right. a lot of navy guys out in the middle of the ocean who will see ufos um or there'll be you know the usos where they see it in the ocean first and it comes out and, mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes you know he, uh my friend uh our old state director jeff kraus he had one case where it was like the whole ocean around this ship suddenly lit up like you know like christmas and uh, it was the middle of nowhere. There was nothing out there. And, and suddenly they're, they're on top of like, you know, somebody had taken a mile wide searchlight and put it under them. So, oh my. Yeah. That's, people. That's almost like the end of the movie Abyss or the. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love that movie too. <laughs> I told you I'm a movie buff. I, yeah, me <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pull too. those out all night. <laughs> <laughs> if I turned the camera around the other way, you'd see my, my, other books you know a lot of them you know some classics and a lot of science and astronomy but boy there's a whole lot of science fiction in there because I, I eat that stuff up wrangling cats what's he's, that so he's he's got two cats blob and whiskey and uh when they're acting up he has to leave and wrangle some cats <laughs> oh i get it okay yeah it's a nice cartoon too oh yeah <laughs> well he i think he puts that up there because when he's doing that he doesn't want people to investigate what he's drawing quite yet he wants to oh, I see. keep them in the dark so to speak. sneaky <laughs> so right. move on so mm -hmm. let's say that i went outside tonight and i had a complete random experience whether it's a orb or an actual triangle with without mm. the lights well don't call it an orb because move fund they they're they're trying to distinguish they we we're not we don't do paranormal investigations okay. 
there are wonderful paranormal investigators out there and and uh, we know that it's a real thing and and i think it's pro it's connected it's probably part of the spectrum like renario hernandez believes but uh you know we're we it's better to say spheric uh j just describe it you know uh, a foot a sphere that was a foot across it was self-illuminated and seemed to be under you know intelligent control uh came through my window and i had cancer yesterday and today i've got a clean bill of health uh that's a good you know that's a good report that's but if you say orb then it's like oh so it was a ghost he had a ghost you know <laughs> said and we don't really do ghost uh hunting you know we're we're the you know mutual ufo network so yeah. but again you know i i will say i mean we i know the paranormal is real i've had strange experiences with that and through my life as well but uh and uh, I think that everything is connected somehow. Uh, it may be different parts of the same spectrum. Uh, I think Valet is kind of of that mindset. I know Ray Hernandez is and a lot of people I respect. Uh, but this, the tack that we take in the way that we do this, um, you know, we want to be scientific about it, use scientific language. Um, that way, you know, you have a physicist come in or, uh, and, they, and they read a UFO report it's it's not uh you know they're not going to think that we're hunting ghosts or something they'll take Correct. it very very seriously so what is the process after you get a report like you just had tonight what what process do you go through to weed through these things and figure out what they are and is there almost like a a level of criteria where okay this one needs investigation where this one we can just say yeah is, is there levels of sure. importancy mm-hmm I, uh, you know, sometimes if, if, if something comes in and I, I can see like the little propellers on the prong, you know, on, you know, it's a, it's a drone, you, you zoom in on it, you can see the little propellers and I know the lights flash so many times in, in, in five, 10 seconds. I'll write in state director's comments to my field investigator. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, you can see the prongs on the side with the propellers you know, the lights are flashing this many times. It, it has, it, this really does look like an orb to me. Mm -hmm. um, and with those, you know, I kind of expect my people to, you know, if, if, if something comes in where a family is abducted, say, or, you know, or they, they all have a close encounter with a craft and it's right there in their face. Well, I want people to drop everything and go and investigate that case. You know, that's that's a very important case. They're all important, and especially, you know, when they happen to you yourself, you know. Yes. Um, but we do, I mean, we will sometimes have 80 cases come in. Uh, I, I, I've got Southern California. My, my good friend Ruben Uriarte is the state director for Northern California. We kind of cut the state in half because otherwise we would be swamped. I mean, California is the size of, of many countries and, mm -hmm. oh, and, and it just, uh, and it is the, the biggest hot spot for UFO sightings in the world. We get more uh, case reports from California than anywhere else. You know, I mean, 80 cases in a month for my team. Uh, that's and that's like nine people. That, that's not unusual. Right. You know, so I used to live in Shasta County. That's where I was born and oh, raised, beautiful right in California. And, and interesting stories. Oh, <laughs> Do you man. see any tall, tall, pale guys with the uh, blonde hair? It's oh, a bit like Marines? Fabio. Or... <laughs> <laughs> I have not. I've seen a lot of the lenticular clouds. In fact, I live close enough to Mount Shasta now, and I've, you know, all of Spaced Out Radio team knows, and I've showed them many pictures. If I drive just a couple of minutes away from my house, because there's a hill right behind my house. If I drive just a couple minutes, I get a beautiful, spectacular view of the the north face of mm. Mount Shasta. But when I was living down in Redding, that's where most of my crazy events would happen, where I was seeing craft. I was seeing, wow. and I that the one that I was telling you, or when you did the cross, it was doing that. And there was two of them that night. And mm. then a couple of weeks later, I seen it again. It was chasing me. Wow. So it's like there is so and it's the same county that I seen Bigfoot in. I was within 30 mm -hmm. feet of that dude, locked eyes with him. It wow. <laughs> he tried to hide, still saw him. And wow. uh yeah, no, 
that whole part of, I mean, Northern California, Southern Northern, in fact, the whole PNW is just a super hot spot. Yeah. And I mean, there's weird stories about tall, the tall whites, they call mm -hmm. them, you know, uh, entities there. And, and uh, you hear about, you know, that they have such a high level of telepathy and uh, just very interesting stories. I have had to meet one of those guys, but I've certainly heard uh, a lot of cases that came out from that area. Yep. Uh, it's, it's an interesting place. And yeah. in some places seem to be more interesting than others as far as that goes. You know, there are UFO hot spots. We have Topanga well, Canyon here. That's that's a hot spot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Siding after siding after siding. I took a night shift there when I was still working as a nurse. Uh, just for the fact that I would be there, I could take my breaks out there, you know. <laughs> and I was always turning the lights out, you know, trying to get my eyes, you know, so that they aren't, you know, you know, so that they're dark sensitive again. Mm -hmm. I never saw anything. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking, never saw anything. I don't know if my, my ET buddies were just being cruel or, you know, elbowing me and laughing at me or I was just <laughs> unlucky. I don't know. You, know? <laughs> uh, you ever want to come you ever want to come north you're more than welcome to stay here with me and i'll take you and show you some beautiful I, i'm gonna where be are you in, you're, where in canada are you are you at i'm actually in i'm actually you're, in southern oregon oh you're in oregon yeah oh. i can i can see mount shasta as long as i drive oh. about a mile away from my house away from the hill but yeah i'm in southern oregon right now oh well, my, i've got a bunch of buddies there you know mufon oregon is at the symposium, we were, we see, well, we all liked the craft beer. So at the yes. end of the day, we would go over to the, you know, the little adjacent, uh, I guess it was the yard house or something. And, uh, and that was with my buddies from Oregon. So shout out to Oregon. You know, yeah, yeah. We have, we, we have a lot of things here and craft beer is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and it is amazing. It's a little hard on the belly but <laughs> oh i know i have to watch it we're I'm kind of trying to substitute for seltzers you know <laughs> but yep. I, I don't know well i have a i have a cold ipa in the fridge for when we get off the you know show later so. oh i, I got a few of those myself <laughs> I didn't yeah. want to get loopy while I was talking with you guys. <laughs> talking about it. weird stuff already. And if you, you know, then you're sitting there drinking a beer, it might, you know, get the wrong idea. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I do love my uh, IPAs. I, 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 you know, I, I used to be like a Guinness, a Guinness guy. Yeah. I like the dark beers. I just, the, you know, the light ones were just mm. too nothing. And then the craft beer, the craft ale came out and it's like, Oh, where have you there been all my life? But now, now I have to watch. I have to watch them or I'll be the expanding Earl, you know. <laughs> so it goes. Oh, my goodness. So, Earl. <laughs> That's awesome. So but that Willy Wonka, the girl that ate the, the blueberry gum or what? It's pops or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Violet. Oh yeah, that's right. That's her. Violet, you're turning violet, Violet. I know, Earl. You're you're <laughs> turning yellow and giant. You know. Anyway. <laughs> oh, See, I didn't even drink one. I'm still saying loopy stuff. Oh well. Well, hey, it's it's par for the course with us. I'll tell you. You gotta that. keep a sense of humor, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I see so many ufologists that are just so serious. And, and it's like, I go nuts. I mean, some of the stories I hear and just stuff I've gone through, mm -hmm. uh, would uh, you have to keep a sense of humor about it? Or, oh, you know, it would, it would make you go crazy. So I laugh a lot. I tend to joke a lot. Um, for some people, it kind of shocks them at first, but it seems to work for me. And, you know, it seems to be, you know, just a survival mechanism in this field. You have to keep a sense of humor. You have to be able to laugh at it, you know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I agree completely. And there's crazy stories, you know, it's like the, the snake river story where the guy, you know, the, the aliens ask for water and they, they make them buckwheat pancakes. It's so absurd. <laughs> and, and the, you know, what I noticed grant is, is that the better cases, there's always this note of absurdity in there. I think that it's intentionally absurd. Sometimes it's to throw us off balance and, and just, uh, you know, you're not in Kansas anymore. Your, your presuppositions don't work in, in this scenario. So right. you might as well throw them out the window 
You know, you have nothing to compare this to because you've never seen anything like this. You've never gone through anything like this. And uh, maybe that's their objective or, you know, one of the main objectives is to break our, uh, our the little boxes that we put our reality into. You know, mm -hmm. we get very comfortable with our little comfort zones. Well, this is real. That's not real. Um, and and they, they just want to shake that up. Uh, for us to be come like magicians of technology uh we have to have more of a openness to you know a magical reality around us and the more you learn about physics and things like spooky action at a distance uh it it it, it leans that way that's the way that things work uh isaac newton is boring <laughs> even einstein you know his whole thing you know it's like well god doesn't play dice with the universe oh yeah he does <laughs> he apparently loves a good game of dice you know so oh my goodness so, <laughs> so you're an experiencer as well then so yes i am yes i mean has this been going on how long has this been going on uh i'm one of those strange cases where you know all of my life i've been intrigued by extraterrestrials i've always known and believed that they must be out there uh i didn't necessarily think they were here yet but i i always knew that we, it just the law of averages uh, unless there's just some you know evil space god that created one world to just be alone out in the hinterlands of the milky way galaxy you know we're, we're just like one little you know then called it the pale blue dot uh a nothing world and and now we're seeing the 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 photographs that are coming from the new space telescope and we're we're really starting to have visuals of just how grand and and, and expansive uh that this universe is that we live in um we simply be the only ones uh unless there's some malevolent god that did that as a cosmic joke and you know why do that you know uh it, it doesn't make any sense so just scientifically minded i i always knew we were you know that the universe was peopled um but i had never had a personal experience and and uh when i became a field investigator <laughs> interestingly enough i did um we can talk about it if you absolutely. want absolutely i gotta hear this sure this is where you poke them and they're poking back huh they were poking back um <laughs> i'd i'd had a few cases i'd closed and and i remember i closed a case that was a gold mylar star-shaped balloon and it was way up there and I felt kind of bad for the guy, but because he was sure he had seen a UFO, but all he had to do is zoom in on it. And I, mm -hmm. I kind of, I went to Am, you know, I went to one of an online store and found a picture of the same balloon and sent it to him and said, "Well, doesn't it look a bit like this?" Or you know, um, <laughs> but I, I was feeling my oats that night, and but I had been trying the CE five meditation. Thing. I'd, I'd done meditation earlier in, in life and and I, I was pretty good at it I put it down for a while and I took it up again uh, with the express purpose of I want to meet you I want to meet you uh, I didn't designate who you know I was thinking in my head you know I'd read about Valiant Thor I think that was the image I had you know as I well I wanted to you know meet some space brother or some beautiful space sister that would to give me a, you know, a, a tour of the cosmos or something and tell me all the secrets. Uh, so I had been doing that for maybe a week and a half to two weeks, I guess. And uh, I had closed shop. I was ready to go upstairs. We lived in a, a two story in Burbank, California. It wasn't a rural area. Uh, it was part of Burbank, you know, city. Uh, I went upstairs and uh, I, my wife was already asleep. And uh, we used to have a cricket problem. Uh, this always comes to mind because it was just so. This it was the first time that our room ever s sounded quiet, but you couldn't hear the crickets. It it's uh, slowly buffled down to nothing. Like, you know what? What? 
there's no crickets. Uh, I noticed that there was this light that was filling our room and it wasn't like you, you know, you'll turn on a light and the light will flood your room. That's the way photons work. You know, it's the speed of light. So you click the light. It's not like somebody's pouring water into the room or something. And, you know, when you flick the switch, um, that's just the nature of, 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 of light. And, uh, but this was, light with no source there was not a, there wasn't a lamp um you know the smartphones were upside down um there there was no nowhere for it to come from and it got brighter and the brighter it got i started feeling very very peaceful um we had the television you know the bathroom was here television was here um and then our closet was over on the right and the bed was kind of in front of where the tv was and that part of the wall started spinning around like in a, it was like a clockwise spin um <laughs> and i wasn't questioning it questioning it uh, that's the other thing uh, i realized that when they take over they really do take over um uh, and um uh, so I, I wasn't worried about it. I felt peaceful at first. Um, and then I realized I couldn't move. And that's when I started getting really scared. I was sitting up in a semi-recumbent position. I had, I'd had a, a hip surgery a few months before. So it was more comfortable for me to be sort of sitting up like in a lazy boy chair style. You know, so I had a bunch of pillows. Was not asleep. Wide awake. I'd been working on UFO cases. Hadn't smoked anything. I was still working as a nurse. So, you know, they would test us, you know, every once in a while. And, you know, you not, you know, you don't want to, you know, have your license pulled. So, uh, but anyway, this weird, ineffable thing is going on around me that doesn't make sense. Um, the wall started spinning and it looked like somebody had poured creamer into a black cup of coffee because it looked almost like a little spiral galaxy spinning around there. Uh, anyway, it, 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 the wall was spinning and it opened up. It almost opened up like an iris. You know, it started from the center and went out to the border, you know, the periphery around it. Mm -hmm. um, there was a tall figure that I saw first. It looked, I thought it looked like a guard or I thought of it as a sentinel is the word that popped in my mind that somebody was standing there guarding the gate. Um, I couldn't really see any features because the light was coming from behind him. So he was backlit. So it was really just a shadow figure that I saw, but, but it, it was solid, you know, it was not a ghost. Uh, it wasn't uh, ephemera. It was, it was uh, a living uh, entity. Uh, I'm starting to really get scared, and these four diminutive, you, you know, they, they speak of them, well, you got the one guy behind you on the wall there, um, the, the proverbial gray four-foot-tall guys. They didn't walk up to me. Mm -hmm. They just, either they were floating like a millimeter over the carpet, or they had a platform that they were pulled in on or something. I, I don't know that they did not walk up to my bed. They just were suddenly in, around me. Uh, two on each side and two sort of at the foot of the bed. Uh, I tried to communicate with them. There was nothing coming back. The two that were closest to me were literally in my face. I, I their, their eyes were hypnotizing, and I mean that in a literal sense. Um, it seemed like I was pulled more and more into a hypnagogic state the longer this went on. Uh, they had these two tubes that they attached to my chest, one on each side, uh, uh, like right uh, clavicle area. And uh, I felt like I was being drained. At this point, I started screaming at them in my head. I was, you know, I, we went from, uh, please speak with me, you know, who are you, you know, what, what are you doing and where are you from? And, 
you know, uh, are you peaceful? I'm peaceful. And, you know, at this point, it's just like, ah! it, you know, I, I mean, you guys have a family show, so I'm not going to, you know, the, the things I was saying were probably not very, I wasn't being a very good interstellar emissary. At that <laughs> point. Um, but this went on for a while and I literally, I wasn't, you know, I'd read enough, you know, I'd read Bud Hopkins and I'd read, you know, enough things where I you, usually people will get like a calming, peaceful message, you know, don't worry, uh, you'll be okay. This is for the good of humanity or helping our race. Nothing, you know, just the guy's like brooding stare in my face and, and taking my blood and energy or whatever, you know, I felt like it was my blood. That was what I was afraid of that they're going to exsanguinate me like the one of the cows that they find along the road. Um, but no, they didn't do that. You know, the tubes disconnected uh, and they just like pulled back on their own. And the, the entities never stopped staring at me the whole time. Now, my wife was here next to me in the bed, you know, mm -hmm. but she never came to. She was just out like a light and she's a light, light sleeper. Um, but you know, the room being filled with light and all this stuff going on, you know, so they obviously had put her out, mm -hmm. um, and they drew back through the hole in the wall that they came in through, you know, uh, now there's no room to park a spaceship between my old house and the neighbor's house. There's maybe 10 feet between the two buildings. So, you know, whatever you want to call that, what opened up there, uh, you know, whether it was a dimensional thing, well, obviously it was something like that because, uh, you know, you, you couldn't park a spaceship there or anything else. Um, maybe a little mini Cooper, you know, <laughs> and I don't think that's, you know, I you know, could see distance. So the wall closed up the way that it had opened, you know, it was the same irising thing, but backwards, mm -hmm. you know, contracting back to a, a concentric point and then it was gone and there was the TV set. Uh, it was still quiet. There was still light in our room, but it was fading. Um, by the time it was dark and, and it was maybe 10 minutes after, after they had left, I could finally move, and when I could get squeak out anything, I was just yelling and screaming. I was at the top of my lungs. I was afraid. I was angry. Uh, mostly, I was just scared and shocked. And and you know, they're not my space brothers. They, if they are, they're not very good brothers. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, my wife's reaction was was that I was insane. You know, she just said, "Oh my God, you joined this crazy UFO group, and is this what I have to look forward to?" And I just <laughs> kind of curled up and huddled there in the bed. I I was, I didn't, I just was in shock. Uh, ontological shock is what you know John Mack called it. Um, my reality had been pulled out from under me, like a magician would pull a tablecloth out from under the dishes. I was still there. It was still me, you know, but everything changed from that point. It's like BC and AD, you know, and, and, yep. and historically, uh, that was the point where my life completely changed. Um, two nights later, my wife is who woke me up. She's shaking me. And the room is still actually lit with light when there's no source for it. And, you know, Lisa said to me, she said, uh, you need to tell your, she's pacing, by the way, pacing by the bed, which I've never seen her do before or after. And she said, you need to tell your little friends that they need to leave us the F alone. She used the F word, you know, <laughs> thinking about your young viewers and stuff. <laughs> but she, she said, you need to tell, you know, your little friends that they need to leave us the F alone. I, I don't want this. I don't need this. And uh, thank God that she, because not thank God that she probably met up with those guys as well. OK, uh, that the idea that I think it scares her to the point where she doesn't even want to she doesn't want to talk about it. Yep. I mean, she sat and listened to me talk about this at the symposium because she was there to kind of support me and she loves me. I have an amazing wife, uh, but it's very 
it's difficult for her to hear. And for her, she forgets everything except for the light. She does, she remembers the sourceless light and she knows that that's impossible physically. So mm -hmm. she knows that this happened. Um, there's no way for that to physically happen in this world. So uh, she believes, she believed me from that point on. Uh, two nights after that, the light again, we both woke up. And this time it was also coming from outside of our house in, in the middle of Burbank, you guys. It's not some rural town. If they want you, they're going to get you. This is what I found. I, I think that they create a little bubble of their own where their reality is 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 taken hold and, and that's what you're put into. That's why the Oz effect, why you don't hear anything. It's like the cone of silence in the old mm -hmm. Get Smart sitcom, you know, <laughs> except it works a lot better than the cone of silence. <laughs> um, but, you know, you couldn't. Uh... Anyway, the third the third night, and we call it the the our weird week. Um, you couldn't see where the light was coming from because it was directly above our house. Uh, neighbors lights were turning on. Uh, their porch lights and stuff. And uh, and then it, it was suddenly like somebody flipped a switch. It was gone. Uh, and that, that was my that was my experience. Now, after this happened, I, I started experiencing synchronicities in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, meaningful uh, meaningful coincidences would happen. Or I would think of an author I would want to meet and it would be in the grocery store, you know, a, an hour later. Uh, it, it was just uncanny. I knew something had changed because things, it seemed like, the, you know, the, the, the rules had changed <laughs> in my reality. Um, I, I, my empathy had gone just through the rafters, you know, it just, uh, I started feeling other people's uh, anxiety and pain and, and, uh, and joy as well. Uh, their feelings I could just pick up. Um, telepathic stuff. Uh, I had psychic flashes still do to this wow. day. They used to be random when I was young, you know, every once in a while, there'd be something where I would know something. It mm -hmm. came out of the blue and, and oftentimes it would be something that would save me from a lot of grief, you know, or from, you know, some, some guy, uh, you know, hit my car head on and and his father was a lawyer and i just happened to be in the room and heard the somebody talking to his friend about oh did you hear about so and so's son you know he's, he's like you know this hot you know lawyer with with all this stuff but he had gotten this new car and he hadn't even gotten insurance for it yet now that's a nice psychic flash to have i <laughs> called the guy up i said well you know, oh, it was on his birthday. His girlfriend was sitting on his seat and he crashed into this guy head on. So I called this guy up. And I said, first of all, happy birthday. Second of all, I'm so sad to hear about your insurance expiring. <laughs> and that at that point, he took care of it all. Right. So I guess somebody's been watching out for me all along, you know, and there's maybe that kernel of that gift perhaps was always there. But now it's off the hook. You know, I, I will have intellectual leaps sometimes or connecting the dots uh, case to case, it comes in very, very handy uh, doing this ufology thing. Oh, I can and, imagine. And working with experiencers as we do. See, if this had ever happened to me, I, I wouldn't have the compassion. I wouldn't have the understanding. If somebody told me a wild story like that, you can bet your, you know, bottom dollar. I would, I, I would have been questioning it constantly. You know. Um, and and now though now i'm fit to do this because i've been through it myself and somebody tells me that you know they were working in you know a, you know a marine base and they were you know abducted through the ceiling and uh like this one gentleman was and, and his family has heard this story all of their lives i mean the guy is you know a, a decorated vietnam vet who has PTSD, not because he went to Vietnam, but because he was abducted through his barrack ceiling. Yep. Um, now I have the tools and the capacity to deal with that. Um, and I think that maybe that's, you know, uh, it, it all seems to, to have a reason to it when I look at it now from a distance. 
but back, you know, seven and a half years ago when it happened, it just, um, that it was just pure ontological shock. I couldn't imagine why they did that. Why me? Um, you know, I'm, I want to make contact. I don't want to be treated like a lab rat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kathleen Martin, she believes that I came in, in, in touch with the, a renegade group of the greys. Uh, that's, you know, I, I met her, I met with her, uh, I joined the ERT about four years ago. That happened seven years ago. I, I met with uh, Kathleen at, at AlienCon to talk about my experience. Little did I know she was actually interviewing me for the ERT, but I didn't <laughs> know that at the time. Yeah, I was just uh, one of my heroes in ufology wanted to have lunch with me. Hell yeah, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were talking and then she said, well, how would you like to be a member of the experiencer we were the experiencer research team then now we've changed the acronym to resource team because mm -hmm. we're we, we we're a resource we we are like the the humanitarian wing of mufon we're there to help people i didn't have anywhere to go when i had my experience i told my state director and he is a nuts and bolts guy back then it was the last thing he wanted to hear that his you know main field investigator had just been you know <laughs> visited by aliens and they put tubes on him and all i mean i will i'll never forget his face his mouth was just like and and, and then disappointment you know it was just like oh god i thought i was yeah i thought he was gonna fire me you know because <laughs> it was just too far-fetched it's crazy yeah well, I, um, I knew peter robbins he was helpful Peter Kathleen Robbins is wonderful. Yeah, Peter yeah. Robbins helped me, and 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 then my state director. Well, he had an experience of his own later on, so he, he finally came around. But uh, <laughs> well, I mean, when you get people that oh, I I flew the ship, or the the real fun one is they they get into the ship, they seen it on the outside, and then when they get in it, it's like infinitely huge. I, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> Doctor Who, than, right? That's yeah. right out of Doctor Who. And you hear that all the time. And yeah. so you're just, and, but it's so consistent. That's, I that's what I, once I started listening to these and getting people telling me the stories and they're like, yeah, you know, well, what happened? Well, I got in the ship and I was literally sat down. Where do you want to go? And then they connect mm -hmm. to the ship via like the ship is alive. You hear a lot of that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, all we the way up to like that. It was the, the, I was talking about the spherical craft that the woman that's probably what you know stirred your thoughts about this, mm -hmm. but it wound up being closed as an unknown. And the reason why is, is because there's a military base right next to where this, where she, the way that she, she was telling her, um, her husband about this over and over again, that this is the most detailed dream I've ever had. It seemed like it was more than a dream. And she talked about flying over this military base and seeing the people pointing up at her and getting all excitable. Well, there were, there was a report from that night from that military base that they had a UFO, a spherical UFO that hovered right over the base um, my chief field investigator interviewed the, the, all the people that had reported that from the base and the, the, this, this person that, that put the report in. And that was, she was flying a craft and, and there's witnesses and that got an unknown. And I, I don't let those go real easily. I want there to be a witness or something, you know, I, I want there to be more than just a good story. Uh, but, there you go. So that's uh -huh. apparently a thing. How come I didn't get a right up flying saucer, dudes? You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe tonight, you know, maybe some other time. Huh? Be careful what you wish for, my friend. That one, I, I'm not being careful. I, I want to get to fly in a flying saucer. As long as I get to come home, you know, eventually, <laughs> you know, there's uh, some fantastic don't stories eat me about or it. anything, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, like even when Commander David Fravor and I, I, I know I've mentioned it twice now, but when someone had asked him, you know, what did you feel when you saw this? And he goes, man, I want to fly it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hear that all the time. I mean, I had one uh, aerospace engineer that reported a black triangle over by, you know, plant 42 uh, out in Palmdale. That's mm -hmm. skunk works. You know, my mom's buddy. 
Um, and uh, when when the case was, I mean, he was really careful. He was scared talking with anybody about it. He was afraid he's going to lose his job. And But the last thing he said was, do you know how I can get on that project? I really want to be on that project. He felt like it was one of ours. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I mean, I, I kind of think maybe some of those triangles, uh, the ones that all look the same with a light on each corner and the big red one in the middle. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I think maybe that's some of uh, the reverse engineering work mm-hmm. that we've gotten from, uh, you know, the Roswell crash, maybe. I, you know, I tend to believe that as well. I, you know, I, I heard that so. there's, I, I heard there's. Go come ahead. up with at least something from this. <laughs> well, I mean, look at it this way. The Roswell crash, I mean, whether they gave it to us or not, you get things like fiber optics and night vision and yeah, Velcro and, and of all Velcro things. Velcro and, and, and uh, bulletproof uh, materials for, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there's apparently a lot of stuff. I think that the kernel of, you know, Corso's book, uh, a lot of that struck home. I mean, some of it was familiar to me just from my mom, you know, my mom's talk. Uh, it, it really had the ring of truth to it, but it didn't have a total ring of truth. And now, you know, it's like, now I've, I've, I've heard more about it. And I guess that, uh, the, the, the co-author what's, well, I don't, I don't want to diss on anybody, but, uh, so I won't mention his name because I, I like a lot of stuff he does, but I think that he embellished it a little bit to make it oh, yeah. more cohesive or exciting or whatever, but so that's well, a disservice. Don't do that. <laughs> we actually had a we actually had a question there someone had asked sure. a question the question was what does earl make of the chris mellon leak slide nine that they can alter perceptions um because you were talking about when you and your wife the only reason why i brought this up is because yeah. you, you like the oz effect like you're talking about and that's an altered state of perception mm-hmm. and you know we have as we've talked about previously before the show when you have what people call the sleep paralysis but we're not asleep when it happens Mm -hmm. and everything goes quiet or this this altered state of you know perception so what what do you what do you think about this i think that they can that they we see what they want us to see Mm -hmm. Uh, my friend greg bishop talks about this quite a bit that uh you know there's a jock valet showed a photograph that a pilot took of a ufo it was a polaroid camera he saw uh, a saucer disc shaped uh, craft and he he got a polaroid picture they're coming in for a landing and when he could look at what the the picture looked like it was a, a six-pointed star it wasn't what he saw so his eyes saw one thing the camera saw something else mm-hmm. you, you hear about all these spacecraft that actually change shape mm-hmm. right in front of you oh yeah i've i've seen evidence of that i've seen evidence of that I mean, I had, I didn't talk about this and I know we don't have much time to talk, so I'm going to make it short, but uh, I felt, you know, after I had my experience, it kind of initiated, uh, I actually had a couple of UFO sightings and I had never had a UFO sighting before. I thought I might've seen one when I was a little kid and maybe it was okay. Might've been, but um, I saw this V shaped craft is hovering over the school over here as on my way to work. Um, I, I driving up there, I'm going, what is that? And then I'm starting to think, okay, this looks like somebody hoaxed this. How did they, how did they get it to hang up there? What, what's this tethered to, you know, I'm just, you know, it's just the way my mind works. Um, <laughs> I, I'm looking at the, oh, I want to see the cartoon, but I can't read it yet. Oh, I can definitely help. Well, you let me finish that. my story because I don't want to, I don't want to lose my train of thought. The closer I got to this thing, I felt like I was less under control. Mm -hmm. And it, it it looked originally, it looked like it was a a cruddy looking UFO. It looked like a bunch of shipping crates, very, very massive, about the size of a fighter plane uh, that somebody had taken a bunch of shipping crates. It looked rusted and old, but it was hanging there It was major tonnage and there was no visible means of propulsion or lift. It was just, you know, a bunch of shipping containers acting like a lifting body, you know? (laughs) Um, So, but the closer I got to it, and I forgot, there was no such thing as a cell phone. 
You know, I mean, I could have had the smoking gun video, the smoking gun photo. Uh, we have procedures at MUFON. I should have pulled over, called the media, called the home office, got another star team members there um, and, and taking photographs and doing this the right way. But all I could think of was, oh, my God, I'm going to be late to work. <laughs> it was like a mantra. And I, you know, now when I was about 40 feet away from this thing, it was hanging there. I mean, I can still see it in my mind like it was yesterday. Um, it suddenly shifted in perspective. It seemed to foreshorten somehow, like it became more squat looking mm -hmm. and suddenly it was a mile away and the size of a football field and i'm looking at this thing the same object you know but now you know you could see it was distant you know i was seeing it through some you know through atmosphere we had a little haze around it still didn't stop my car okay i was still under the influence of this thing i swear i wasn't under the influence of anything else i was on my way to my nursing job nope. about two miles out or three miles or so I'm almost to the freeway. And that's when I pull my car over and I'm just like shaking my head. Oh my God, what just happened? I can, you know, I'm looking out in that area and there's nothing there now, of course, no photograph, no video. And for some reason, this job that I was working that I really didn't care for that much, you know, I like my patient, but anyway, well, another story, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was a teachable moment. I think they were teaching me about, what we see, what we perceive, and what's really there, that they're in control of this. Uh, now I know why there aren't a million fantastic close-up pictures and photographs of, of UFOs, you know, because they're yeah. under control. It was a teachable moment. So, um, all right, let's see this cartoon. <laughs> Absolutely. Here, I'll pull him up real quick, just so everybody can see. There it is. Trust me, we can party here. Dave is out of town. <laughs> oh, you got like a Bigfoot and a gray and some green uh, ET there. No, uh, no, no, D. <laughs> no, that's great. Oh, please send me a copy of that. All right. On Messenger or something. I want to keep that. That's a good souvenir. That's awesome. Uh, that's oh, really there fun. we go. It, there's the start of the show hiding in the background. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So do you guys have any other questions that are coming from out there? You know, I there's actually a few people that have asked questions. And that one was actually from uh, Jonathan Davies. He is part of another podcast over in uh -huh. Wales. Cool. Uh, really awesome guy. You know, he's pretty well connected when it comes to these subjects. And he does ask pointed questions, which is really nice. If anybody has any questions... For Oral Gray Anderson, please feel free. Put them all in caps. That way we can get to them real quick. We only have about eight minutes before we have to go. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. Make them quick. And please, please, please put them all in caps. But Jonathan Davies also asked previously about half an hour ago, he asked, what did MUFON brief to Congress? What was that? You broke up for a second. He asked what MUFON briefed to Congress. Oh, okay. Well, they, you know, I haven't heard the details, but I know that they were asking us a lot of questions, that they mm -hmm. were very interested in what we had, you know, found. And uh, it felt like very inviting, actually. It wasn't like doors being closed or anything. It seemed like it was uh, kind of straightforward and, you know, wanting to understand the phenomena. So there you go. It's a new day. <laughs> Absolutely. That wouldn't have happened, you know, back when, but that is the case now that there even was a congressional hearing is just kind of mind blowing. I didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime. I really didn't think so either, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. It's one of those where, I don't know. It's, it's amazing to me, even though they don't, yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of people upset. But realistically, when the New York Times threw that out, that yeah. was disclosure to me. Yes. Who would you want from the government to disclose to you? <clears throat> if Biden did it, half of the country would say, oh, he's senile. If it had been Trump, half of the country would have said, oh, he's lying. Uh, if it was <clears throat> Hillary Clinton, they'd say it was the reptilians. 
I mean, everybody's got their prejudices and their likes and their dislikes, and there's no way that uh, it, it wouldn't work. You know, it wouldn't work. Yeah. And and half of the, you know, people would think we were under attack. It was lizard people that wanted to eat their babies, you know. Oh, and, then, you know, then you'd have people running out there, you know, wanting to be, you know, space brothers and, you know, come to my party and yeah, DJ my birthday, please, E.T. You know, I mean, I think people would just kind of go crazy. And I, I think that the way that it's happening is the best way. And this is disclosure mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. You know, and it's disclosure when people have a visit or or they're taken or they see a UFO. That is disclosure right there. I mean, they're not doing air shows to show off, you know, <laughs> like the Blue Angels or something. This, this is for a purpose. Yeah. I don't think that I saw, you know, I didn't see the UFO that I wanted to see. I wanted to see a hot rod, right? You know, the Millennium Falcon or something. And th- this was, uh, you know, it looked like a bunch of very, very massive shipping containers put in the shape of a V. It was not what I was hoping to see. But boy, oh boy, it was sure anomalous. And, uh, you know, yeah. it was a teachable moment. And that's what I think they're doing. You know, and they're probably doing that across the board, to be honest with you. And, you know, it's... It's we're all ready for it. And just like Jonathan mm-hmm. Davies said, confirmation is what we need. We don't need disclosure. We already had it. He is very correct in that statement. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the visitors themselves don't think we're ready, perhaps. I mean, it seems to me people get the same messages. They they from from our visitors. It's you know, nuclear war is 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 bad. It will, you know, destroy your planet. Um, you know, you treat the planet like a trash pile and, you know, your environment, this is your fishbowl. You know, if you soil your fishbowl, nobody's going to come to, you know, clean up after you. And and I think that, you know, we're being told certain things, there's ex- expectations and we haven't quite met them yet. You know, we're yeah. still beating on each other like a, a horde of warriors, you know, living like a warrior cast planet. And I, I think Star Wars is a human thing. I don't think uh, they, they don't want Star Wars. Mm-mm. No. And, and I think that we would be risky and dangerous. We, we need to have an epiphany as a race, um, something that changes us deeply that, you know, we've, we've evolved before, you know, you, you don't use your veriform appendix anymore. You, you've got a tailbone. You don't have a tail. Mm-hmm. You've got, you know, the, and, and now, you know, it's going back to Clark. His whole thing was, is it, once we learned how to build tools, that was the way we evolved. Um, but there's still something else in us that you can't see. You know, call it the soul, call it the psyche. Something needs to be changed in there. And I think that's what's going on now. I, I hope that's what I'm doing. I mean, I try to tell people that if I have a mission, that would be it, is that uh, we need to better ourselves, become less warlike, you know, have a little more patience with your brother. Uh, and sister, if you're on the freeway and you want to, you know, do road rage, try to, te- you know, highway telepathy. That That's the thing, you know, is, is that's a good way to learn telepathy is, you know, kindly in your mind. Not, don't yell at them and call them an idiot because they'll pick that up. You know, I've heard this from people that work for the FBI, you know, remote viewing and such. But, you know, make sure that your attitude is good and just say, hey, could you please, you know, speed up or slow down or move over or whatever it is that they're doing you'll be surprised it works my wife is trying it i i try it all the time now and it seems to it seems to work it's better than flipping them off and possibly getting shot you know yeah. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff we need to do is is new uh you know we need to change our the the paradigm here Yep, right absolutely. now we're on a road that's not leading to any place very good anytime soon. Well, Earl, you know, it's been a great two hours with you, my friend. Thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. And if you wouldn't mind after the show, just hang out just a little longer. Uh, sure. Real real quick, I'm, unfortunately, we ran out of time way too quick, everybody. I can't believe how good conversation really just makes time fly. And this is one of one of the best conversations I've had in quite a while. And I really appreciate you coming out here and joining us for the show, Earl. I, I really do. And I I know that a lot of people in the chats, they were great to, you know, they've been 
awesome. Everybody's asking questions now, and we only got a minute left. I'm but, so uh, sorry. <laughs> I'll come back sometime if you want me to come That'd back, be- and I'll 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 make sure we have more time to answer those. Oh, I. Wow. I'd, I'd like to get more into cases anyway, because I've got a bunch of them you know, that oh, you guys absolutely. would enjoy hearing about. So, Well, real quick, uh, let's see. Kira, thank you so much for that super sticker, as well as La La Bright. You both, we really appreciate your love and support of SOR. For everybody else, Dave will be back, I promise you, and he's going to be back soon. So please continue to watch SOR tomorrow night. And we're going to have a great show ready for everybody. Also as well, Filthy, thank you so much for that beautiful art. I'm going to have to take a screenshot for that, Earl. I want that <laughs> for, yeah, that's cool. I like that. Beautiful work. Uh, oh, he does. He does fantastic work. One, one yeah. thing, if any, if what I've been saying to anybody out there listening, if it, it sounds like something that's familiar to you, go to MUFON.com, M-U-F-O-N.com says report a ufo or report an abduction or an entity uh go and uh click on those buttons and fill out the form and somebody like myself or maybe even myself uh will get a hold of you and investigate your case properly awesome hey earl thank you so much i really Thanks appreciate a lot, it Grant. captain my captain you did a great job thank you sir and uh it was thank uh, you filthy (laughs) absolutely (laughs) you gotta thank the artist man you too thank you filthy thank you have a good night everybody we'll see you soon healthy my friend you too you need bail money give me a call always dad take care (laughs) you too